So let's talk about why I think we're, or, or rather why the community is saying this is possibly crypto alt season and why alt season has possibly began. If you watched our last show, you know that we do think alt season has begun, but the question is obviously is how long will it last? And looking at a bigger picture, is it alt season for the entire year? Because a short term alt season doesn't really help anybody except the day traders. We're looking at this from a macro perspective as long term investors. Is 2020 the year for crypto to go to the moon and beyond? Because it has been a bear market for a long time. So I want to cover three narratives. First narrative is the Bitcoin halving. This is something we covered on the, on the last live stream, but I want to delve deeper into this. How does this impact the alt season narrative? And two, Ethereum 2.0. How is this going to impact the alt season narrative? And lastly, DeFi, centralized finance. How does this impact the altcoin narrative? So, I mean, we have three points right there. So let's go through and hammer each point out. First point is the Bitcoin halving. So many people are saying, hey, Ian, Bitcoin halving is predicted to happen around May or so. Let's, let's pull this up here, Bitcoin halving. Since we def definitely want to make sure we're all looking at the same information here. Okay, so this is BitcoinBlockHalf.com. And this shows us the Bitcoin block halving. So we have 85 days to the halving. So the estimated date is May 12th, 2020. Around 10 a.m. So we have 85 days. We have basically three months. Now, why is this such a big event for crypto? Because historically speaking, Bitcoin has performed well from a long-term perspective. In essence, Bitcoin has gone up post-halving. So if you go through and look at all the other halvings, let me, let me see if I can pull this up here on uh, Google. Let's say Bitcoin halving chart history. Right, so... Let's see if we can find one here on Google. Since Google is our trend. So we got this one here from Master Crypto. Okay, so looking at this, this chart here breaks down the halving into different ranges. Okay, so this was the, the first halving. This is what happened then the second so first halving was november 28th 2012. november 28 2012. i was not in crypto at that time uh the next halving was july 9th 2016. so here we see over 500 days after the halving bitcoin went up from 650 dollars or so to almost twenty thousand dollars and that is, that's, a, that, that's going to the moon and beyond. And before that, we had a bull market for over one year. Bitcoin's price went from about $12 to over $1,000. So Bitcoin went up 92x. Okay, so let, let's backstep here. So first bull market, based on this chart, masterthecrypto.com slash Bitcoin dash halving. So first bull market, Bitcoin went up. 177x so from 17 cents to 31 dollars this was in 2011 then we have a bear so bull market was for 243 days bear market for 163 days then we have some mini sideways action then the next bull market after the first halving november 28th 2012 bitcoin was 12 dollars bitcoin went up 92x over the course of one year 368 days then we had a bear market following that for 408 days then some sideways action then second halving july 9th 2016 bitcoin was 657 dollars total crypto market cap was 12 billion 12 million dollars and bitcoin bitcoin did a 29x i don't know i think this should be 12 billion i think this might be European way of saying of uh, 
presenting that for total market cap. But but anyway, basically we had a bull market for over 500 days, and then we had a bear market for 365 days. Bear market after the all-time high was 84%. So we had, we had an 84% retracement for Bitcoin. Now this really brings back the the old adage which I've been talking about, uh, especially to our customers on tokenmetrics.com via the newsletter and the guides we have. This is the old adage. Markets go up in an escalator or come down in an elevator. Write this down somewhere. Never forget this. If you're a long-term investor in this space, this is something you have to memorize. Markets go up in an escalator. They gradually go up. Then they gradually come crashing. I mean, they rapidly come crashing down. What does that mean? And why does that matter? Well, it matters because this is really why we don't believe in HODL. As much as we like to say HODL because it's a crypto meme, HODLing in crypto and almost in any market does not work. You have to have active portfolio management. What does that mean? You have to actively manage your portfolio. Whether it's through a professional or whether it's by yourself, you have to constantly keep up to date with the news, the trends, the market. Now, that doesn't mean you're out there day trading because day trading is not suitable for everybody. That, that just means that you have to be informed. You have to know when to get out and when to stay in and when to get in. So that means you make a handful of trades, as Bill says. Uh, Bill Noble, our, our, our chief trader, uh, he says... That could be anywhere from three to eight trades in a year. To keep it simple, let's say that could be up to 10 trades in a year. So basically, you can be trading every month or so, or every other month. So it's not necessarily mean, it, it, it does not mean you're out there day trading or even swing trading. It's just you have a long term picture, but you aren't just there hodling Bitcoin. Um, if we go back to this chart here, right? Because I got into Bitcoin really at the, after the, the first halving. I got into crypto around October 2016. So we'll say fall of 2016. That's when I got involved in, in, in crypto and Bitcoin. So imagine you're a smart investor. You get in here, you get, you get into Bitcoin and crypto. Let's say you buy Bitcoin at $650. And you huddle all the way to $19,800. And you huddle all the way down. You would have lost, yes, you made some money. Because let's say you got in 650 and it's at, what, 85%? It's back to 3,000. You made, what, a, a nice 5x? But, I mean, Bitcoin went up 29x. And you lost 84% of that money. Yes, you're still up long term. But... The better play from a strategy perspective would have been to take profits at the top. And yes, timing the top is very tough. I mean, that's what people try to do all the time. But the thing is, you don't have to be perfect to make money or to make a killing. You just have to be close to perfect. Actually, you just have to be in the ballpark. Because let's say you got out at 12,000 to 16,000. That would have been a better play. That's what we call active portfolio management. Being able to look at the chart and say, you know what? I mean, this, this is chaos. This is going up way too much. 29x out of nowhere. Uh, so one example is if, if you see people who aren't really professional traders talking about crypto or Bitcoin, it's probably a good time to take some profits. So I know this was during the bull market, December 2017. I was at my barber, my local barber, having a haircut. And these guys were talking about crypto and Bitcoin. And I was like, man, I mean, Warren Buffett says when this happens, you should, you should sell and take profits. Um, I took some profits, but I didn't really take much. And guess what? That ended up being the peak of the crypto bull boom market back in 2017 and, and then going into January 2018. So you always have to be in tune with your environment. If you see people who normally aren't talking about crypto, talking about crypto, asking about crypto, that's really a sign that, hey, this could be time to take some profits. But anyway, back to the whole narrative. So now, 
following that, we've had 365 days of bear market, some sideways action. We're now up, but we've been expanding in the market in the last 207 days. Now with the next Bitcoin halving coming up in May 2020, historically speaking, going back to, the, to this chart we have, uh, sorry, that's not what I wanted. I'm getting Going back to this, historically speaking, we think the same narrative is going to happen for crypto. That crypto, or rather, because Bitcoin is the predominant cryptocurrency, over 60% market cap is in, is in Bitcoin. We think crypto market will rise. A rising boat, a, 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 sorry, a rising tide lifts all boats. So when Bitcoin goes up, because the supply of Bitcoin, for those who don't know, the Bitcoin, so, so if you just read this, right? The Bitcoin block mining reward halves every, every 210,000 blocks. The coin reward will decrease from 12.5 from to 6.25 coins. So meaning that every reward will decrease from 12.5 Bitcoin to 6.25 Bitcoin. So supply and demand, this is basic economic theory. Supply and demand, so supply will decrease. So we hypothesize that there'll be more demand for Bitcoin. And historically speaking, that has happened. Now, you, just to play devil's advocate, you do have several people who, who say that this has already been priced in. That this has already been priced in, and people are just speculating that it's going to go up, but this is really just a moment to buy the rumor, sell the news. And I do see what people are saying in terms of that. But let's go to the other two narratives that I believe are also playing a factor that some people might be overlooking. So the other narrative is Ethereum 2.0, ETH 2.0. Now, we think this is something that's going to be very, very big. I mean, Paresh Mansani, our CTO, our developer who does the technology and code reviews for us on tokenmetrics.com, he has said that he thinks Ethereum 2.0 is going to be big. It's going to really make most of the competing blockchains out there that have been trying to go after Ethereum obsolete. He thinks that all the other blockchains, well, not all of them, but lots of other blockchains, their primary use case, what they've been claiming to do in terms of scaling and, all, and sharding and all that, that Ethereum 2.0 will do at a much better pace and they have a much better developer community. So let me see if I can pull up a nice post here on Ethereum 2.0. Doing everything here on the fly. Uh, let me just see if we... Okay, so I got this here. This is from Better Programming. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so... Sorry. Sorry, guys. Let me just uh, find this real quick. Do you know what? I'll just wing it. <laughs> uh, so going off the notes we sent to our community, so Ethereum 2.0 is going to have much better scaling. People are saying Ethereum cannot currently scale. Well, with Ethereum 2.0, it's going to be able to scale. And then we'll, Ethereum is also going to be adding lots of other functionality. So Ethereum is looking into adding privacy. Ethereum 2.0 could possibly be... Uh, quantum computing resistant, which is huge because everybody's talking about how blockchains can be hacked in the future once companies like IBM and others develop quantum computing and once that really goes mainstream. So the, the, the issue for most blockchains is what happens if quantum computing makes them obsolete? Because blockchains are meant to be unhackable, meant to be one single version of the truth. But if quantum computing comes around and really innovates and makes almost all blockchains hackable, then, then one of the big premises of blockchain is out the window. Now, Ethereum is going to be, Ethereum 2.0 rather, the goal is to be quantum resistant. And I haven't really heard people talking about that for Bitcoin. Uh, we're still pro-Bitcoin, but we think, because I have talked about it in the past, how I think Ethereum long-term, could be the bigger 
cryptocurrency because it has a growing developer community and they are they're constantly innovating and adding new things. And I think they have better governance than, than Bitcoin at the moment. And because of that, I think it could really propel Ethereum to surpassing Bitcoin in the next decade. So looking at the end of 2030, I think it's highly probable that Ethereum surpasses Bitcoin in market cap. And I know all the BTC maximals out there think that's hearsay. But I mean, just look at where things are and look at the prog progression. Yes, Bitcoin will still be around, but I think the use case of store value is big, but Ethereum is creating a virtual computer. People will be able to develop applications on Ethereum, and this is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and really, if we now look into the other narrative, so the other narrative of DeFi, decentralized finance, this is really going to be a game changer. Everybody has been talking about this. This has been bubbling up. But the stuff that's happening now is stuff that wasn't really possible. I mean, so for instance, there was a, an article I was reading this week talking about this Ethereum um, node. Hold on, let me just, let me, let me pull this up. So there was this person who had a, an Ethereum loan. Came out this week. Let's say, let me pull up this article. It was on trustnodes.com. Okay, so here's, this really shows you the power of DeFi. Now, it could also be very chaotic, and it's very, very dangerous. Okay, so Hacker makes $360,000 in Ethereum from a flash loan single transaction involving Fulcrum, Compound, UIDX, and Uniswap. Okay, so to kind of explain what happened here, so some, they're calling this person a hacker. I don't really think he's a hacker because this was something possible with the code and possible with these different protocols. But what this person did is using these, these protocols and platforms, he was able to get a loan for 630,000 US dollars without putting up any collateral. But the, the requirement is he has to pay it back in one transaction. What does that mean? That means that in one transaction, he borrowed Ethereum and he took that Ethereum. Uh, he, 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 he hedged himself. He bought uh, some, some money, some tokens or cryptocurrencies on, on Compound and BZ, whatever. Basically, he bought two cryptocurrencies, one Bitcoin, one Ethereum. He went, one, half of the money he used to go long and half of the money he used to short. Then this is the part where it does kind of get into a gray Actually, this is probably illegal. He was basically, this is basically market manipulation. He then took the money he had and he, made, he dumped the price on Uniswap. And he used, basically used the money he was, he, he was short on to make a bunch of money. And then he did, took profits and paid back the loan. And he did all of that into one single transaction. So for anybody out there who's ever used Ethereum, you know when you send money from one wallet to a different wallet, so from somebody to somebody else, you are sending one transaction. That's one transaction of sending money. With DeFi, leveraging a smart contract, he was basically able to group a bunch of different transactions via the smart contract into one single transaction. So as a result, he was able to get a loan without putting up any collateral and then send it back after he's done doing his stuff his business but i think stuff like this is stuff nobody really envisioned now this is very very revolutionary i mean this is huge for crypto for, for DeFi, but it's also scary because if if joe schmo or jane schmo can go out there and get a loan without any collateral for a million dollars and do a bunch of crazy stuff this is this could 
really crash the markets possibly, right? Because if something goes wrong, I mean, that, that's very dangerous. This reminds us of what happened with high frequency trading and derivatives with the real estate mar market crash back in 2007 and, eight, and eight, right? Because lots of Wall Street banks, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, were really doing financial engineering. This is a form of financial engineering. And when there wasn't really much regulation to keep an eye and protect people, dangerous stuff happened. So going back to decentralized finance, this is a very big narrative. This is a narrative that wasn't really there. So I think looking at all these different narratives, 2020 is going to be a great year for crypto. Now, obviously, that's just my opinion, not financial advice. But when somebody tells you everything is priced in, I challenge you to, t to tell them, you're looking at just purely the charts. But something that possibly could not be priced in are the fundamentals are changing. Because yes, we have technical analysis, but we also have fundamental analysis. We come from really a factor investing school of thought, or a point of view where we look at lots of different data points. So we look at the, the value. So think like Warren Buffett value investing. We look at momentum as well. So that meaning the technical analysis, the price action, and all of these have been empirically proven to improve performance in a portfolio. Uh, I, I highly encourage anybody out there to do more research on factor investing. Uh, I think it's something that is really something all investors should be well, well versed in. Because factor investing, for those who don't know, is really just looking at different categories and using all of them together to build a portfolio or to make an investment. So you aren't just one dimension. You aren't just looking at purely TA. You aren't just looking at purely fundamentals. You're looking at several different factors. So anyway, back to, to this, right? Back to the question. It's 2020 crypto alt season. I think looking at these three narratives, I know I've been talking for a while, but we have the Bitcoin halving. So Bitcoin is fundamentally changing, right? Bitcoin and historically the halving has done well. So if it was priced in, why were we having all these different bull markets? Because we, we could have said it was priced in back in 2017. We could have said it was priced in back in 2013. We could have said it was priced in all the way since 2011. But despite it being priced in, the market has always improved. And this is just basic economic theory, supply and demand. Demand should go up if the supply for Bitcoin decreases. But then you take that narrative and you add on the narrative of Ethereum 2.0. Ethereum is going to be scaling. I mean, all, all, all the challenges we're having with Ethereum, a lot of them will be resolved. Then you add on decentralized finance. We have over a billion dollars now uh, in decentralized finance. And you have innovative things happening like, like these kind of loans. So essentially financial engineering. So financial engineering is and DeFi and all these narratives together I think 2020 is going to be a hell of a year for crypto. Now, I know I've been talking a lot, so let me stop there. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Now, let's get to the comments.